on, church. Let's just keep our hearts postured towards heaven right now. Let's just keep worshiping Jesus for a moment. to sit and tell you we love you Jesus we're not afraid to sit and worship you a little longer Jesus thank you while we were worshiping I just felt like the Lord there was just a phrase that kept coming into my mind and he he was just I just felt strongly like he was just like I'm on the chase this morning I'm on the chase this morning. I am pursuing this morning. That is the heart posture of God this morning. He's pursuing you. He's pursuing you. And even as I say that, it's just you're being overwhelmed with his love right now. You're being overwhelmed with his love right now like you've never experienced. He loves you. And he doesn't just love you, he likes you. That's great news. God loves you, he wants to be near you. And he's pursuing you this morning. He's pursuing you this morning. Let's just stay right here. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. We are actively drawing near to you. And the Lord says, I'm drawing near to you. Thank you for that love. There's a scripture that says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. The power isn't in what we do for God, our love for Him. It is in His love for us. That's the miracle. That's the miracle this morning. Not that we would say, God, we love you. We love you and we do. But it's that He would reply, I loved you first. I loved you first. So Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for a place and a space to gather. We thank you that you just want to be here this morning, God. We thank you for a love that permeates deep in our bones, deep into our souls. We thank you for a healing love this morning, God. We thank you for a love that frees us. We thank you for a love that gives us purpose and identity. We love you, Jesus. Come on, one more time. Let's just tell Jesus, say, we love you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You guys can be seated. Let's give it up for our worship team. Do you mind throwing me my phone right there? Oh, I used to play baseball, but it's been a few years. Um, I'm not preaching today, but I do have a couple of announcements. Is that okay? Uh, If we haven't met, my name is Christian. I get to help out with communities around here. How many of y'all know that community groups are kicking off in just a few weeks? Yep, it's exciting. And if you're newer to the dwelling, a large part of what we do around here is in community groups. We actually firmly believe that a big part of Jesus's vision for your life, for my life, for our collective life as the church, is that we wouldn't just... We wouldn't just go through life alone and isolated, but that we would make the conscious decision to walk beside some people, to walk in community groups, 
And so over these next few weeks, you're probably going to hear me talk about communities a lot. You're probably going to hear Gunnar talk about communities, other people talking about communities. And I want you to know what we're doing when we're talking about communities. We're not hyping up an event, okay? This is not about us as a church trying to garner as much participation as possible for an event that we're holding or something we're hosting. We are intentionally trying to engage with and lean into what the Lord is doing in our lives. We're trying to, to actively be a disciple of Jesus, and we think that you know that's what it looks like. And so Sundays are incredible. These experiences are incredible. And if you've only ever experienced the dwelling on a Sunday, and that's the context you have here, uh, first of all, you're, you're so welcome here, and we're so happy that you've been here on a Sunday. But I do think you will miss so much of what we do as a church, so much of what we believe deep uh, spiritual formation is, so much of, of, if I'm being honest, what I believe the Lord wants to deposit in your life, if you just come on a Sunday, like if you just come on a Sunday, you'll miss a lot of what, of what we're doing. And again, this is not hype for an event. This is just our core conviction as a church that if we are going to live, look, and love like Jesus, then we're going to have to reorient our lives a little bit to do that. And so in community groups, what we have is a practice that we see in the life of Jesus that we can pull from his life and bring into our own life, right? So that's what community groups are. And I'm gonna read, uh, I'm gonna read this little scripture for you guys. First John, and this is one of my favorite scriptures when it comes to community groups. It comes out of 1 John that says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Touch somebody and say, it's complete in us. So translation of that, what is that verse saying? Well, how can you expect to know God if you aren't loving like God? And how can you expect to love like God if you're not in a community group where you get to practice loving other people the way that God loves us? And we're by no means trying to be idealistic and say like, hey, our groups are perfect. We're not naive, right? We don't have perfect groups. And our goal is actually not to have perfect groups. Our goal will never to be to have a perfect community. But our goal is to give us a practice where we can be brought into the ways of Jesus so that we can be transformed into people of deep, sacrificial love, right? So Sundays are just a pep rally. Y'all remember pep rallies? They're hot and sweaty. The entire high school is in a gym. There's no AC, at least at the high school I grew up in. We were, maybe it was just a little country town. But pep rallies, <laughs> but we got any people from Vidalia in here? Come on. Okay, a couple. But when people got together in the pep rallies, it was loud. People were getting energized. They were getting excited and hyped up for the big game. The pep rally was not the big game. Sundays are not the big game. But they rally us around a fixed point, and they give us vision and energy and touch from Holy Spirit to walk then in power the rest of our weeks. And so that's what community groups is. This is our vision of what groups are. So when you're signing up, that's kind of what you're signing up for. And where else can you really do that other than a place where other people are trying to do the same thing, right? So if, if you're new and, and maybe this is a little daunting, the idea that you, would, that you would come into a room of people in a very intimate setting and, and meet strangers, if that gives you a little bit of anxiety, maybe you're somebody who has social anxiety around doing those kinds of things, can I just let you know that there is a safe place in a community group where you can ease in to other people's lives and they just wanna come alongside you and they just want to love on you and walk with you through that and it's easy. It doesn't have to be this big thing but there is a space like that created for you guys in a community group or maybe this is just a tough season for you. It's been one of those seasons where things are just heavy, you know what I mean? Like you're just tired and you need a place to rest. There is a space that exists 
where you can come in and people just want to come alongside you and shoulder that weight a little bit and give you just a place where you can breathe a little bit and maybe catch your breath, right? And they're not doing it out of obligation either. Can I let you know that? They're doing it out of an overflow of love that they've received from Jesus. That's the attitude. That's the heart. Or maybe this has just been a season of loneliness. And you're walking around right now, and you know that there's not anybody that knows you deeply. So can I just encourage you? Find a group because there is a space where people want to get to know you deeply. They don't want to just know the surface stuff. They want to be friends, and they want to know you deeply, and they want to walk through life with you. And so if any of that sounds good to you guys, if, you're, if that's you or, or you're somebody who wants to um, walk deeper in spiritual formation, then sign up for a group. Sign up for a group. It's, it's a, an incredible thing that we get to do here. And I've never had anybody come back at the end of a semester and be like, nah, that was a waste of time, you know? <laughs> it's only ever been the opposite. It's only ever been the opposite. Um, I'm about to jump down, but before I do, I wanna let you guys know how you can sign up for groups and where you can do that at. So before I do that, though, I wanna introduce you guys to some, to some folks. These are our community group leaders. Come on, give it up for our community group leaders. These are the guys that are like physically creating the space. Like we're trying to do that as a church, but they're actually doing it, creating a space in their homes or in other places around the city so that people can come in and meet each other and, and get more from the Lord. So I'm gonna introduce you to these guys so you can kind of put a face to the, to, or put a name to the face. So if community groups, if you guys wanna stand up when I call your name, we got our Ardsley Park community. That's gonna be Stephen and Ansley, Josh and Amy. If you guys are in here, come on. We've got our downtown crew, and that's going to be Catherine and Mitchell. We've got our Wilmington Island community, and that's going to be Dan and Amanda, George and Gretchen. We've got our Pooler community, which is going to be Josiah and Emily. We've got our Southside community, Chris and Patty. Come on, are you guys here this morning? We've got our Windsor Forest community. Come on, that's Taylor, James, Ashley, and Leo. We've got our West Savannah community. That's Chuck, Shay, Delinda, and Michael. We've got our old Pooler community, so in the old part of Pooler, that's Jason, Brandy, Nate, and Nicole. I think that's everybody. Um, so here's how you sign up for groups. So groups are actually starting February 18th, so we got a couple weeks. Groups fill up fast, so what you wanna do is if that is your neighborhood or people that you wanna be a part of, then find them. They're wearing a lanyard like this, is there a QR code? Okay, I thought there might be a QR code. There's a QR code on this lanyard. There it is. You can scan that right now for the next 30 seconds before it goes away. And you can sign up directly for groups. Find these people with the lanyards. You can also go to our website homepage. There's a link on there as well. So sign up for groups. It really is part of our house, and it is a very formative part of our house. And we're so excited for what the Lord's going to do over this semester. So thank you, guys. I'll turn it back over to Pastor Gunner, and I'm out, you know. <laughs> All right. So sign up, right? All right. So we also have prayer rooms happening three times a week uh, in this room. You can check the website or the Church Center app to find out those times. Uh, Youth Sunday is today. So grades 6 through 12, you can uh, just have a great time after service today. Uh, Parents' Night is March the 12th. You can register on the Church Center app or the uh, website as well. So if you've got kiddos in the house, um, that's a really valuable night for you because you get child care and you get poured into and uh, it's going to be good. I wanted to give one other announcement before we jump into the message today. Um, is anybody familiar with the Circuit Riders ministry? 
I mean, there's like an old school circuit riders on the horses, you know, back in the day, day. But there, this is like a worship uh, evangelistic uh, type ministry out of California. And they go into college towns and they, they hold events just to preach the gospel to young adults and college students. And so they're coming to Savannah this month. And we get the honor to host them in this house, uh, the 12th and the 13th. That's a Monday and a Tuesday night at 7 p.m. The first night on the 12th will be for ladies only, okay? So if you're a college student, young, young adult, you're invited. On Tuesday night, it's for everybody, for Carry the Love, all young adults and uh, college students. So if you're scad in here in Georgia Southern, where are my college students at? This is your night, okay? So mark that down on your calendar, Tuesday the 13th, and the women's event is the, the Monday before that, all right? Carry the love. It's going to be good. Right before Valentine's Day. How ironic, right? All right. So we kick off a new series today called One. One. O-N-E. One. Let me ask you a question. If, God forbid, you went to the doctor this week and the doctor looked you in the eyes and said, you have a terminal illness and you only have two weeks to live. I want to ask you this question. What would be your dying wish? Just think about that for a minute. What would be the thing that you would pray for that you would ask God for, that upon your death, this would happen? What would be your dying wish? I'm gonna read Jesus' dying wish this morning out of the Gospel of John, chapter 17. And I want, you to, I want you to catch the importance of what he's talking about right here. He's, he's praying in the garden. This is the night he's gonna be betrayed, arrested, and then later he's executed on a criminal's cross. But this is his dying wish. Listen to what he says. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, just his disciples that he poured three years into. But I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. So if you're a believer in the room today, he's praying for you right here. Okay, catch that. He's praying for you and me. And he says this, this is my prayer that all of them may be one. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, there's a, a large chunk of Scripture devoted to this time where Jesus is in the garden, and there's a later part where he's dr sweating drops of blood, and he says, not my will, but yours be done and all that. But this included in this prayer. And the main point of this prayer is I have come, Father, to accomplish what you sent me to do. And now I'm going and leaving them and you're going to send your spirit to empower them to do what I'm praying for right now. So Jesus modeled for us what the Holy Spirit empowers in us and through us. And so what we're talking about in this new series about becoming one is very possible by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. All right. But this is the main point of his prayer. He says, my dying prayer is that the people who believe in me will be one in us, Father, and they will be one with each other. So there's a word that we talk about sometimes and we say, well, what we need in the church or what we need in the world today is unity, right? And I would agree with that. I think that we can somehow sometimes have an idea of unity that looks a lot more like uniformity. Like we think unity means you got you to gotta agree on every single point. You got to look alike, sound alike, talk alike, you know. That's not unity, that's uniformity, and that's not very interesting, is it? I love variety. I love diversity, and so does God. He created it. Whether it's the color of your skin or whether it's your ideas and your opinions and your talents and the giftings he's placed in your life, he's put us on a diverse planet, 
diverse people. And how many know that doesn't change when you come into the family of God? You bring your diversity into the family. And Jesus loves that. But in our diversity, he's calling not just for unity, but he's calling for oneness. He's not only called us to unity, he's called us to oneness, to be one with each other as we are one with him. There's many places in the New Testament where this whole oneness idea is talked about. Paul, in his letter to the believers in a city called Corinth, in chapter 12 of that letter, he says this, just as a body, a physical body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Gentiles or Jews, slave or free. In other words, it doesn't matter where you came from, what your identity is, who you, where you, what side of the tracks you grew up on. It doesn't matter. We're all called to the same thing by the same spirit that is the body of Christ. We're all given one spirit to drink. So even the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And so the hand doesn't accomplish the same thing the foot does, right? Well, some of y'all, some of y'all can do some of that stuff with y'all's feet. <laughs> Freaks me out, man. Y'all can write a letter with your foot. I don't know. But it, we're not, the, the tongue is different than the leg, than the shoulder to the ear. You know, we've, there's all different parts. And we're not just one big ear, right? We're, we're not called to be ears. We're called to be different parts of our body and be true to who God created us to be in Christ and celebrate that and not, my, not major on the minor differences that we have or the differences of opinion, of opinion that we have, but actually value oneness over everything. So I think about unity and I think about agreement, right? I think about uh, us agreeing with each other and I, I realize that there are some major foundational things that we need to agree on, right? There's the, this, uh, this faith that we have is a confessional faith. It's like we believe this. We believe that Jesus was God and he came in the flesh and he carried his sin on his shoulder and he, he died on the cross and he rose from the dead and he's coming back. Like those are the foundational things. And we have agreement. We have unity in all those things, right? But if I took a poll here in this room this morning and I asked you about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if I asked you about eschatology and the end times and all the little, the little parts of theology, I guarantee you we'd have some differences of opinion in here. And I love that, by the way. But that's not, that stuff is not the main thing, right? Right? And, and we've got to, in, in order to pursue unity, not just unity, but oneness, we've got to actually keep the main thing the main thing. We've got to major on the majors. The one thing that we find unity around is Jesus and the gospel and our mission. I think we get really, really distracted by a lot, don't we? And I, you know, I value the I value the distinctives that we have as different churches and everything. But I was walking around. I have three opportunities this week to just walk through the our city. We live in an awesome place, by the way. Yeah. If you grew up here and you're used to it, like I'm sorry, but this is great. This is awesome. But I was walking around and I was like, I walked by this massive church, and then I walked down a little further and there's another church. And these things have been here for years. And I thought, like my, my family is in that house right there. Like sometimes we say, oh, those are the, those are the Lutherans. <laughs> and we immediately just start piling up everything that we might not agree with about what the Lutherans believe or whatever. And we draw such a hard line of distinction. Oh the, oh, the Presbyterians. Oh, the Pentecostals. 
You know, like, and we have these ideas like, well, well, he's Baptist. So, you know, like, I love the diversity of the body of Christ. And there are, there are differences of opinion. There are differences of belief. And look, God's going to work all that out. I'm called to love. I'm called to love my brother, to love my sister, whether they're Presbyterian or Anglican or whatever the, the thing is. If, they're, if they love Jesus, and if we're in the same family, we need to act like it. And so oneness is even... It, it's even more specific, really. It's, 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 a, it's a greater calling than just unity. I may not agree. And I don't have to pretend like I agree, you know? Like, we just got to be honest and stand firm on convictions and stuff. But don't let it build a wall between you and your brother or sister in Christ. Some of y'all are here today and you're like, this worship's wild up in here. I don't know how I feel about this, you know? But I love, I love, love, love the, the, just the, the liturgy and the, I love the order and the structure in certain forms of worship. I had a, I had a dream one time, I've shared this dream before, where I was in uh, an, a, a traditional church in our city, right down here in downtown, and we were reading from a book together, out loud. And in the dream, just the truth of what we were reading and experiencing together. And it was silent and it was still. And the presence of the Lord fell in that place. And as I was waking, there was like this voice in my head as I was waking up that said, I can move wherever I want. He can do whatever he wants to do. So how about we just start erasing some of these lines of separation and division whether it's race or whether it's denomination, I'm telling you, the enemy knows what he's doing. And he's so scared of the body of Christ that he will keep us divided. I believe that the one thing that's holding reformation and revival and awakening from this city is division. It's we got our thing over here. And we got our thing over here, and we don't mix with you guys because of, and we've got a laundry list of things. I'm telling you, I feel like one of the primary callings in this season of my life, and pro probably for the rest of my life, is to put my heels down in this city and love everybody and pull people together. And I really feel like that. I was telling Josh this week, like I feel like God is calling us as a house, not just me, but calling us to be that kind of bridge kind of place. In prayer more than anything else. And so oneness is what we're called to. It's not just an idea. It's not just a good idea to get something done. Right? We are focused on the mission. But actually oneness is our identity because we are one. We're not many. We're one. We are one. And living in, as one is not dependent upon agreement as much as it is dependent upon covenant. Oneness is about covenant. And listen, I know in the American church, we get really squirrely when we start talking about covenant. Because we, like, we don't like that whole idea. I feel like, you know, marriage, the, the whole idea of it being a covenant isn't, doesn't hold the weight that it used to. I, I feel like that we're so individualistic in the way that we think and the way that we live. It's like, no, it's like me and my family over here and like, yeah, the covenant's here, but I don't have a covenant relationship with anybody else. But Jesus has actually called us that no matter what, we're together. Like whether we like that or not, whether we think that's comfortable or not. Now, I think we should all have boundaries that are healthy. But that does not give us an excuse to not live as one. So the plan A for the mission of Jesus in the earth is our oneness. I think we kind of say, well, we're just going to preach the gospel to all the nations. And then hopefully we can kind of be one and united in on that. No, Jesus actually says the way that happens is you're one. And you live like it. So how do you live like it? Becoming one 
it seems like this insurmountable task, doesn't it? With all the things that we can be divided about, it seems like this is huge mountain that I don't know that anybody's ever taken. Can we take this mountain? And it's really not that hard because Scripture is full of specific details of if we just do this, this is how we become one. But it's going to take a really big dose of humility and a really big dose of obedience and intentionality. And this whole series this month, we're going to be looking through some of the one another's in Scripture. We do this just about every February because it doesn't get old and there's too many in Scripture. All over and over and over in the New Testament, there's this love one another, serve one another, greet, welcome one another. I'm going to go through some of these, but in this month, we're going to take a few of them and really dig down deep into the ones that we feel like the Lord is, is kind of highlighting for our family right now. But listen to these, love one another. Do you know love actually has got to look like something? We can't just say, I, man, I love you, Trey. Like it's got to look like something. It's got to be perceivable, perceptible. It's got to be tangible. Yeah. So what does it look like for me to love my neighbor as myself? Love one another. Jesus said in John 13, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. This is how they'll know that you're my disciples. By the way that you love each other. That's John 15, John 15, Romans 12, Romans 13, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Peter 1. I mean, over and over. I've got so many right here. You wouldn't be able to eat lunch if I went through all the scriptures that just said, love each other. Just love one another. And then in Romans 12, 10, I'm hoping to share this in a couple of weeks, maybe next week. Honor one another. Romans 10, uh, 12, 10 says, outdo one another in showing honor. What does that even look like? What does that even mean? Welcome one another. Greet one another. Romans 16, 16, get this. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, that's no excuse for the creepers. To... Okay. Get this. Like I knew that was in the Bible. Honestly, though, this week, I didn't realize this in there four times in, in Paul's letters. Greet each other with a holy kiss. Well, that's cultural, you know, that's cultural. Some of y'all do that anyway. I get a kiss on the cheek every once in a while. Welcome one another. Romans 15, 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. What if we welcome people, not just in our church building on Sundays, but welcome people into our living room? What if we welcome people into our lives? We welcome people into our places that maybe personally, we don't let everybody else in. Hey, can I just be vulnerable with you? I think one of the things that keeps us from being formed into the likeness of Christ is our unwillingness to open our heart to the community around us. This is how, this is how, this is how formation happens. It's through oneness. And oneness looks like honesty. Oneness looks like vulnerability. And I'll be honest with you, my, my primary like personality trait is not to open up. It's not to be honest. It's terrifying. Because we're so scared of like, oh, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to think when they know I let out a little cuss word every once in a while? You know, like, <laughs> y'all know some of y'all thinking of that. Like, but we get so, like, we get so hung up on that little stuff. Like, y'all, I hope you know by now this church is pretty jacked up. <laughs> like, we're, we're just all jacked up in our own little ways. Yeah. And not that we should stay there, but let's don't hide it. I think that's what's turned so many people away from the church is you walk in, everybody's perfect. And everybody knows you're not perfect. Quit acting like it. Let's be real, right? If things really stink in your life, let's don't play like everything's okay. 
How are we going to grow? How are we going to be one if we're never honest with each other? Welcome one another. Show hospitality to one another. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality without grumbling. Well, I'm going to get these dishes washed. <laughs> Got company tonight, you know. <laughs> Listen, it, there's, there's just got to be a mindset shift, right? It's like, why are we here? Why do we exist? What is this thing? Is it just to come on Sunday and do the church thing and go? No, it's, like, it's, it's, it's being with one another, being formed into Christ in the context of community. And one of the ways we do that is through dwelling communities. And so, man, there, that ought to check our hearts right there. If there's just like a grumble in us about like, well, I guess I got to do life with people. I kind of want to, you know. It's actually good for us. It's actually really good for us. Have fellowship with one another, 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he in, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Live in harmony with each other, Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony. Don't be haughty. You know what that means? Haughty. Don't be haughty, shawty. <laughs> Don't be haughty. But don't be prideful. Don't be high-minded. Don't be aloof. But associate with the lowly. I, I would even say this. To be, like, to be like Jesus, and we're becoming like him, right? Not just associate with the lowly. Identify with the lowly. What does that look like? What does it look like? Um, yeah. Be at peace with one another. Mark 9, 50. We, we know this scripture, but we lose the context of the scripture. Listen, it says salt is good, but if the salt is lost, it's saltiness. How will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Being, being this, living this life with a kingdom flavor that looks and acts and sounds and feels like Jesus has a lot to do with relationships with one another. If things have gone sour horizontally, things aren't good vertically. So just to, just to search our hearts today. If oneness is the goal, there's actually some things we have to do to get there, right? Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted, Ephesians 4.32 says. So, some of us, that's so easy for us. Right? That's kind of our personalities. Some of us want to fight. And so it's like, all right, Lord, that's my verse of the day, you know. Be tenderhearted toward each other. Ephesians 4.32 Forgive one another as Christ forgave you. Forgiveness. Walking in forgiveness. Colossians 3.13. I'm reading a lot of Bibles. I mean, it's church. Is that okay? <laughs> and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. I mean, it's optional if you're not going to follow Jesus. But one who has given his life, her life, to follow Christ, forgiveness is not optional. Because oneness is not possible without forgiveness. Bear with one another. Man, that's a hard one. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 is full of these things. Verses 2 through 3. With all humility and gentleness... And patience, bearing with one another in love. I love this. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Like so eager. Like running peace down. There's another verse, I think, in Hebrews. Strive to be at peace with everyone. Like run that thing down. If you feel like there's some unforgiveness, 
run that person down. That's how oneness happens. Phone calls. Hey, I need to talk. Can you meet, by, can you meet for coffee today? That's where oneness is birthed. Don't run from that. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not the Lord. As a matter of fact, sometimes he'll call us to do super hard things that are the right thing. More often than not, the right thing is the hard thing. Comfort one another, 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort each other. We've been talking a lot about deserts and valleys in the last few months and some of the things, the trials that we go to, through and suffering. And guys, when things are heavy, yeah. oneness looks like coming alongside somebody yeah. and speaking encouragement. It, it looks like being there for somebody. It looks like hugging somebody's neck when they need it. It looks like being a shoulder to cry on. Does that happen if we're not open and honest about ourselves? No. I, I, I see this too because the church, I'm not talking about this church, but the church in general, because we have been so closed off with each other, we carry our own stuff. We carry our burdens and we carry our sorrow and we carry grief because we have no one to carry it with us. I'm telling you, the best thing for us is community. It's a gift. Because when I'm heavy, when I'm when I'm, I'm heavy burdened, yeah, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. But he's also given us a family to bear each other's burdens with. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Hebrews 10.25 says, don't neglect being together. Now, some preachers said that means you need to come on Sunday. You know, like... But actually, neglecting being together is bigger than a Sunday thing, right? This is what communities is for. Don't neglect being in community. Don't neglect that, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. And all the more, because the day's coming. That's what Hebrews says. So build each other up. Exhort each other. Instruct one another. Teach and admonish one one another, sing with one another, stir up one another to love and good works, Hebrews 10, 24. Do good to one another, serve one another, wash one another's feet. What does that look like? I mean, you could physically do it. What does it look like to wash someone's feet? That's a question I've asked myself recently. What does it look like? A, a question he's asked me or I've been asking the Lord lately is what does it look like for you to wash my feet Lord like because he wants to he wants to wash your feet and the religion uh, the religion in us wants to be like Peter and say no not I Lord no I'm not worthy I, I don't think that we can wash others feet unless we've let him wash ours we got all kind of reasons for washing feet, serving people, make us feel better and all that. But I'm telling you, if you've been served by the Lord, and if, you've, if he's looked you in the eye and he's washed the dirtiest parts of you, then you don't mind getting dirty. You don't mind getting down into the, into the dirt with people and loving them where they are. Someone once said this, when you wash someone's feet, I can't remember it now. I, I just went out there and now I've, I said it. You see where they've walked. Yeah, you can't see where somebody's walked unless you wash their feet. Thank you, Josiah. That's a team effort, okay? Was that Josiah? It was Rob. Rob, sorry. Josiah, you can be a part of it. Submit to one another. I ain't doing that. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5.21. Speak the truth to one another in love. Ooh. Some of us don't have any trouble speaking the truth. 
It's the in love part. Right? And some of us don't have much problem with the loving people part, but then we call it love, but we're not willing to speak up and speak the truth if they need to hear it. Man, the Bible just rubs me the wrong way. It does. I just need to be more like Jesus. Don't speak against one another. Don't speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges a brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge, James 4, 11. Don't grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. And James says, because the judge is standing at the door. Judge not lest you be judged. Don't provoke one another, Galatians 5, 26. Don't envy one another. All of these one another's all throughout Scripture, where does that happen? In community. That's really the only place it can happen is being with each other. Humanity is where spiritual formation happens. Community is where we become like Jesus. Community is where we sh share the joys of life. Community is where we share in the sorrows of life. Community is where oneness happens. So here's my challenge to you today. If community scares you, it's time to take a risk. One more time on community. I get why you wouldn't want to. Some of you walked in today, even coming to church today was, it was painful. Because you're like, I don't want to put myself in the crosshairs again. Yeah. I've been hurt too bad. But if I can just lovingly ask you, give community another chance. Yeah. Give it a shot. Take a risk. Let people in. What does it look like to pursue oneness in your life? Let's all stand. Father, thank you for your, your word. All your words that help us and guide us and pierce us and transform us and mold us and make us. We pray that This month would be more than just a message series. It would, just, it would be more than just a theme that we're talking about. But by the end of February, our hearts would look so different. Our church would look so different because we've embraced oneness in a radical way. So, Lord, we invite you. And if this is your prayer, just put your hand on your heart if you want to. Just... Just some way to just acknowledge, Lord, this is, this is what I want. Lord, I want you to transform my heart that I'm one who pursues oneness. Lord, transform my heart to the point where I really do love people like you love people. Lord, my goal, my desire, my wish, my prayer is to be formed into Christ. So, Lord, now I, I open the door to my heart that I've closed off and I... I'm letting you in, but I'm also letting your people in that I might be more like you. And Lord, also that you might use me to touch other people's lives and to make them more like Christ as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, don't go home or don't go to bed tonight until you've signed up for a community. Right? Get on, get on the church website, get on uh, church center, find a group that's where you, where you live, find someone, talk to somebody, hey, which community are you in? And get in one, okay? Good? God bless you guys. See you next Sunday.